This program has been funded in part by a grant from Olelo, the Corporation for Community Television, Honolulu, Hawaii. In 1991, the Honolulu Episcopal Cathedral of St. Andrew experienced a far-reaching cultural exchange, a gift of eight English change-ringing bells for the church's tower. Unlike the British colonies where bell ringing is a custom, the heart of the Pacific has not had a set of bells such as these before. And it is more than just a gift of bells for a church tower. It is a gift of new tradition linking once again Hawaii, a small Pacific island state, with England, another island on the opposite side of the world. On a beautiful day in February 1991, members of St. Andrews and the media gathered on the pier overlooking Honolulu. But their attention was directed to a large shipping container. The bells have arrived after crossing the Atlantic, sailing through the Panama Canal, and across 2,500 miles of the Pacific Ocean to this pier in Honolulu Harbor. An 11,000 mile voyage in all is now completed. Present is the donor of the bells, Laith Reynolds. For him, this is an exciting moment. He's seeing his gift at its best, cleaned, tuned, and engraved. I when I last saw it, it was buried in, in, in guana. I've never seen it like this. So you could tell there was a bell there, but they'd been, having been abandoned or left for 80 years, the birds had just covered them. There. It has been four years since he last saw these bells. Eagerly, he shows off the inscriptions and other features. Near Holy Altman, who was the patron saint of the church they came from, long forgotten shades to their to thee, our notes we raise. For thee, for thee were made. Forty miles west of Birmingham, near the Welsh border, lies the English town of Shrewsbury. Growing gradually after the departure of Roman armies, this ancient Saxon village dates from 5th century AD. As people settled, they established four Christian churches, all before the Norman conquest in 1066. One of them was St. Alkman's, founded in 912. In 1788, the people of St. Alkman's pulled down the original building, leaving the medieval tower and spire intact. In its place, a modern church was built. Described as Church Warden's Gothic, the new building was opened for worship on November 8, 1795. The old tower and its spire were repaired. Today, the great eight bells of St. Alkman's are being removed. Their long journey to Honolulu and the tower of St. Andrew's Cathedral has begun. Although the tower and spire date from the late 14th century, it is not certain when bells were first hung in St. Alkman's or how many. There's a, a, an old legend that in 1533, the devil actually came to this church during the course of a high mass and caused a lot of trouble and left his claw mark on the fourth bell. I sometimes get rung up to um, be asked about that particular legend, but at any rate it suggests that in the 16th century there may have been four bells. 
Because good bell metal was hard to come by in those days, the common practice was to melt down an old set and recast new bells from the material. In 1621, the original bells were cast into a set of five and a treble bell was added 70 years later. In 1812, the bells were melted down for the third time by the noted bell founder John Bryant of Hartford to create the present set. The eight bells called their congregation to church services for almost a century. Then they were silenced. As far as I know, uh, the bells haven't been rung as a major peal since uh, 1911. And the reason for that is that they are wrongly hung, as I've been advised in the past, and that the um, ringing of the peal here caused a swaying of the tower and spire, which of course would be, would be dangerous. So the, it was a question uh, in 1972, just after I came to this church as its parish priest, as to whether we should um, have them rehung and refurbished, which would have cost a, a very great deal. And at that time, it was thought that this church might have a short life, that it might be ma uh, made redundant. That, mercifully, that cloud has passed, and there's a great future for St. Altman's. But nevertheless, th that was the thinking at the time. And so we decided to sell the bells. And uh, the Shropshire Association of Church be Bell Ringers came up with a splendid scheme, as we thought. Their intention was to give them to a nearby town which would erect a special tower for them. Unfortunately, the project proved to be too costly. We tried to find a home for them in this country, in this diocese, in, in this county, but modern churches aren't built to receive peals of eight bells, and so that wasn't practicable. Laith Reynolds is passionate about bells. Besides being a bell ringer most of his life, he is driven with a mission. In the last few years, myself and some of my associates have been intervening in the process where a number of rings of bells in England were broken up and destroyed, often usually melted down to cast new bells. This drives him to seek new homes for the bells to sound out again. If there is a house available, housing, and ringers in England who want the instrument, we would normally not attempt to intervene because we've tried to avoid the, uh, the stealing of our heritage style of view amongst English ringers and amongst the uh, conservationists in England. But there have been a number of occasions when we have been able to pick up quite spectacular instruments. However, Reynolds could not locate a new tower for St. Auckland's Bells. It was during a trip to Hawaii that the successful Australian miner got an idea. We attended service here and I was struck with the thought that they may well fit into this tower here. And <clears throat> contrary to the problems that we've had on all of the other attempts to use these bells, primarily in, in Australia, the uh, project has proceeded at a pace as if it was meant to be. We were delighted when a very firm offer came from uh, St Andrew's Cathedral at Honolulu so, through some good friend of theirs and what's happening now is the bringing of that to fruition. As the bells are lowered to the street, they pass through the bell ringer's room, once a hub of social gatherings and serious ringing. On the walls, empty coat hooks and old tablets pay silent tribute to the bells as they leave the church. These stone and brass documents attest to ringing accomplishments long forgotten. The goal for bell ringers is to ring a perfect peal, continuously pulling all the bells in a prescribed pattern for three hours without error. Bob Smith removes the clapper to prevent potential damage to the bell during transit. A bell ringer, he is responsible for the refurbishing of the bells and their installation in Hawaii. He is a partner of the Air and Smith Company, the third largest bell hanging firm in England. It started very much as a hobby. We, we're all bell ringers. Everybody in the organization is a bell ringer. I've been bell ringing for 35 years plus, um, but all of our employees are bell ringers. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, our two full-time main bell hangers have both got degrees in engineering, um, but they're enthusiasts. The bells are finally all down, and it's the end of a very long day for the workers. The next morning, the truck arrives and the bells finally exit the church. Thank you.
Church members and neighbors gather to watch the bells exit the church. The work is slow and careful as the heaviest bell weighs 1,370 pounds. We've got to come as near as far as you can, really. Hang on. Straighten your wheels up for going Don't down the slope. You You're selling your country's heritage. Don't be like that. No, it's necessary, or it'll not, not aspire over. Well, there's the last of the eight bells on its way. Sad in one way, but we've known since 1973 that uh, they would really have to find a new home. And it's a great joy that they're finding a home in Honolulu, where they'll welcome people to worship to the cathedral there, I hope, for centuries to come. So although it's a sadness in a way, it's also a, a, a great joy. At the Bell Works in Melbourne, the old headstocks are removed and the loops are cut off. These are referred to as cannons, and it was the way that many years ago they hung the bells from wooden headstocks using straps to secure the bells to these. Next, the bells are shipped 150 miles to Langwith Metal Finishers in the southeastern corner of England, where they will be blasted clean of centuries of pigeon droppings. For the first time, the bell's inscriptions can be easily read. The bells are quite a nice ring of bells by Bryant, um, but when they were cast, they hadn't got the modern um, facilities for tuning the harmonics as accurately as we can do them nowadays. So they will be going from our works, that's Aaron Smith's works at Melbourne in Derbyshire, down to the Whitechapel Bell Foundry in London, where we've already sent them an analysis of the existing notes, and they will tune the harmonics. Whitechapel Bell Foundry is a name synonymous with famous church bells. It has been in business continuously for five and a half centuries. This notable foundry has produced the America Liberty Bell in 1752 and the famous Big Ben, which weighs in at 13 and a half tons. Most importantly for the bells of St. Alkman's, the bells will be subjected to rigorous testing and tuning. When a bell is struck, there is more than one sound. There are actually five tones in any bell, new or old. These are the strike note and an octave lower, the hum note, and the tap note, which is an octave above the strike note, and a minor third and a perfect fifth. The tuners here will listen to all tones and correct them. Musical ears is useful uh, when one first tests the bell uh, by striking the different uh, areas in the bell to bring out the partial tones. Uh, one can listen to the different tones and, and decide roughly what sort of notes or uh, harmonics they are. And then one can go off and get the right sort of tray of forks, you see, and be within a, a few, a few uh, cycles. Some of the partial tones in old bells tend to be flat and some of the partial tones are sharp. So it's a question of trying to bring the sharper tones down, not actually catching up with the flatter ones, but certainly improving the distance between them. Chalk marks are made where the metal will be shaved to produce a better set of sounds. Once 
Dave has taken his uh, cuts, I can test the bell again, and then I will be able to see how much the bell has moved. Um, and then from there, of course, I can decide how much more there is to go, and uh, therefore what my next cuts are going to be. But there'll probably be a series of five or six different tests before the bell is actually finished. In terms of weight, the bell will lose something like one quarter, 14 pounds in weight. Uh, and I suppose it'll lose about three sixteenths of an inch, perhaps, in the, in the waist. Uh, but that, that's still going to leave something like an inch and a half, which is, uh, which is plenty. Well, that's it. That's the last bell tuned, the ring of eight. And uh, in my opinion, at least, it sounds a lot better than it did formerly. And of course, it will relate much better with the other bells now that all the bells have been tuned. And of course, in a few days' time, they'll be picked up by a lorry and transported to Melbourne, where they'll be equipped with ringing bell fittings before being shipped to Honolulu. But first, the donor has requested that each one will receive a name of a Hawaiian monarch. Seven bells will bear the name of a king. The treble bell will be named after Queen Liliuokalani, Hawaii's only reigning queen. The reason for naming the bells after the eight monarchs is firstly I'm an unabashed royalist and uh, high Anglican, and the history of this cathedral intertwining with um, Queen Victoria, Queen Emma, um, and the uh, rise and fall of a Hawaiian monarchy is a story that's fascinated me for a long time. And as there are eight bells and um, it is into this royal cathedral, I felt that it would be um, a highly desirable thing to have the bells renamed in honour of uh, the monarchs and the era of the kingdom. It is often difficult to rename bells, but again, that was one of the interesting facts that the bells had no names before, and this is very unusual. So it was very easy to inscribe them without having any conflict to any previous names that may have been on the bells. These are English bells, now with Hawaiian names. While the bells are tuned and refitted, Bob Smith designs a bell frame for the St. Andrew's Tower. Earlier, he traveled to Hawaii to take measurements. The latent fear in such a project is that, like the Tower of St. Auckman's, poorly hung bells can create severe structural damage. One of the things that we have to do is to make sure that we equalize the loading out on the tower. So uh, the bells are going to be arranged that, uh, looking in the plan view here, which is looking on the top of this, um, that a certain number of bells swing this way and a certain number swing that way, and we do the calculations to equalize the loading out on the structure of the tower. The bells will be mounted in a square, However, the bell ringers will stand below in a circle. Through a system of pulleys, Smith designs a way to accomplish this change of geometry for the ringers. The drawings are sent to Honolulu, where the frame will be built according to the English specifications. Soon the bells will follow to their new home. Several months later, Bob Smith's drawings are now beams and girders. Each piece has been pre-cut and numbered according to the English plans, now in the hands of David Webster. A British steel engineer, Webster has come to supervise this critical step in the bell's installation. He is doing this for the love of bell ringing. It isn't a profession of mine. I actually do this as a hobby. So I've come out here without any pay. I'm a bell ringer, and uh, I just happen to think that um, we have to put as much back into bell ringing as we take out. And it's a question of using my expertise for the benefit of all ringers. Because the bells will swing nearly full circle, the frame must be able to carry not only its static weight, 
but also the weight created by the bell's movement. Webster estimates that the largest bell alone will exert a weight of nearly two and one-half tons. Parishioners from congregations throughout the island bring their banners and their curiosity. Today, all will be a part of the official and public welcome for the eight English church bells to Hawaii. They come in red wagons, or on a leash, and for the children with their bells on. The bells arrive dressed for the parade. They are not decorated with flowers as one might expect in a tropically lush Hawaii. Instead, they are covered with three types of green plants, each holding symbolic significance in Hawaiian mythology. It is the Hawaiians' thought or belief of long ago, at least as passed down to me uh, by my parents, that the dearly departed, the spirits of the departed ones of the gods, all reside in the mountains, among the foliage and greens of the mountains. The uh, bells are draped with the maile, which is a very uh, important significance to the Hawaiians of old and still carried on today as a, a symbol of peace, of love. Uh, the lawae is another symbol of peace and love. And uh, of course the tea leaf, always uh, part of the Hawaiian's everyday life. Now that the day of the parade has finally arrived, anticipation is high. There will be speeches from church and state officials, and from a personal representative for a Hawaiian princess. The choir master has composed a new hymn in Hawaiian in honor of the bells, and the February skies have held back their rain. Soon, the bells will be home. In ancient times, the kings of Hawaii were venerated as godly beings on this earth. As godly beings, all good things of the earth and sea came to them by divine right. This was in accordance with the precepts of the old theology of this place. For 1,000 years of human life, all things were theirs all works of man, all of the land itself, and all of the wealth brought out of the sea. It was 172 years ago, in the month of Velo, by the old calendar, in the year one of the reign of Iolani, Kalani Kua Liholiho, King Kamehameha II, that the king of Hawaii severed his connections with the many gods of old. The church did not come here uninvited. Historians surmise that the first Anglican service in the Hawaiian Islands occurred when English explorer Captain James Cook prayed from a Book of Common Prayer. The year was 1779. American missionaries arrived in 1820 and within the following 40 years converted and educated many Hawaiians. As the foreign population increased in the islands, 
so did the number of Anglicans. But unlike the Congregationalists and the Catholics, these worshippers were without a priest or church to call their own until the reign of King Kamehameha IV. 21 years old, Alexander Liholiho, Kamehameha IV, ascended the throne in 1854 as Hawaii faced a time of great challenge. The giant powers, Great Britain, France, Russia, and the United States, looked upon the tiny islands as a potential acquisition. A treaty of annexation to the United States had been drawn up by the previous monarch, and the sugar planters pushed for its ratification. Sadly, the Hawaiians themselves were not well represented in the king's own court. His people had been decimated by diseases carried to the islands by the newcomers. Sympathetic foreigners were appointed to critical cabinet posts. This was the world the new king, the reigning ali'i or chief, was inheriting in 1854. The ali'i of uh, the mid-19th century were definitely Hawaiian, definitely ali'i, uh, uh, very much grounded in their ancient culture, ancient position, but they were also very European. They had all been uh, schooled very carefully in you know, modern studies. They all knew languages, they all knew s the social graces. So you had a, uh, a dual culture operating at the top of Hawaiian society at that time. Soon, Alexander Liholiho became engaged to Emma Rook. Related to the first Hawaiian king, Emma was Hanai, or adopted in the Hawaiian manner, to Dr. T.C.B. Rook and his wife. Emma's English foster father and an English governess taught her British values and the love of the Anglican religion. The couple was married in 1857 in Kauaihau Church, built by New England missionaries. But upon their request, the congregational pastor willingly used the Anglican Book of Common Prayer for the services. Two years later, a son, Prince Albert, was born. Like other families, the royal parents wanted a church in which they could worship together. An invitation to bring the Episcopal Church to Hawaii went out in earnest. The Hawaiian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Robert Crichton Wiley, was devoted to the king and the preservation of the sovereignty of the islands. He could see growing American importance in the political circles and feared republicanism as the king's downfall. For more than a decade, Wiley, a Scotsman, had seen the political value of bringing to Hawaii this British institution that by its very history and traditions would support the monarchy. But I'm amazed at the extent to which the Hawaiian ali'i wanted the Anglican Church for itself. I mean, for what it really was, uh, you know, for purely religious reasons. The king wrote directly to Queen Victoria to establish the church in Hawaii. With Wiley also negotiating, their plea was finally heard. On December 15, 1861, the Reverend Thomas Nettleship Staley was consecrated to head the new missionary diocese of Hawaii. His first duty was to travel to Hawaii and baptize the royal heir, Prince Albert, godson of Queen Victoria. The fact that Queen Victoria agreed to be the godmother of the Prince of Hawaii had great significance uh, for the Hawaiian people. Here was the, the greatest monarch of the world, you know, agreeing to uh, establish this relationship with this very tiny kingdom at the very opposite end of the world. An advance party of the British Consul to Hawaii was sent ahead, carrying this beautiful silver christening cup, Queen Victoria's gift to the young prince. When the New England missionaries discovered that a bishop, not a parish priest, was on his way, their initial support turned to alarm. Back in uh, 1620, remember, uh, uh, the Puritans left for New England because they did not like the way uh, the uh, church was uh, operating in England. And then, uh, uh, out here in Hawaii, uh, the problem comes up again. Uh, the uh, New England missionaries had the work pretty much to themselves, and here uh, the uh, uh, Anglicans were coming, and there was uh, going to be a great difficulty in adjusting to that situation. Then tragedy hit the Hawaiian royal family. Four-year-old Prince Albert took ill from a cold, and within days, 
died on August 27, 1862. Unfortunately, Bishop Staley was still at sea and did not arrive until almost two months later. After a good voyage, we had just arrived at our destination. We had handbills printed at once about divine service next day, Sunday. Holy Communion was to be at 9 a.m. and Matins, Litany and Sermon at 11 a.m. Many natives crowded in and stood around the windows and doors, and some of the foreign residents said they had not set foot in a church for 20 years. The service was in English, except for one hymn sung in Hawaiian by the king's request. In preparation for our coming, he had been working on the translation of the litany and morning and evening prayer, which were just ready for printing. The king said, we welcome this mission sent by our friend, the Queen of England, to help our people and hope that this church will be the real church of my people into which they can bring all their gifts. Several days later, Queen Emma became the first member of the new church. I went early to the palace and prepared the queen for holy baptism. The reason she had not been baptized before was that she wished to be baptized and received into this branch of the Holy Catholic Church and none other. She spoke most reverently and intelligently. On November 28, 1862, the royal couple was confirmed and the Anglican Church was established in Hawaii. After her husband's sudden death in 1863, Queen Emma saw to the construction of Queen's Hospital where their beloved Hawaiian people could receive medical care. Her dream of education for the young Hawaiian women was realized in St. Andrew's Priory School. The royal couple's history is poignant and tragic. Premature deaths had destroyed a marriage and a family. But in no way did these tragedies mar the commitments made to bring a better life to the people of Hawaii. These bells rang for the coronation of Queen Victoria in 1838 and we owe the founding of this cathedral to Queen Victoria who responded to the request from King Kamehameha IV and Queen Emma to send a bishop. So this cathedral is of royal founding and really attributed to uh, Queen, Queen Victoria. Certainly these bells reflect our English roots and I think will be a new part of the tradition in Hawaii. Once again, we give them the chance to ring out to the glory of God. Their call is that we also may be a people of peace, of strength, of courage, of goodness, and that we in our living may give voice to the glory of God. King Kamehameha IV, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I name you King Kamehameha V, in the 
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Situated in the heart of Honolulu is St. Andrew's Episcopal Cathedral of the Diocese of Hawaii. Its magnificent structures are listed on the National Historic Landmarks Register. When Bishop Staley arrived in Honolulu, one of his first challenges was to build a church. The king and queen raised the funds and gave a plot of land on which the cathedral now stands. On March 5, 1867, four years after his brother's death, King Kamehameha V laid the cornerstone for a permanent church building with Queen Emma in attendance. It would be named for St. Andrew, on whose feast day the young king had died. During a fundraising trip to Europe, Queen Emma chose the English architect B. F. Engelo, who would design it in the 12th century French Gothic style. Stones were cut out of English quarries and shipped around the Cape Horn. After additional construction and the payment of their bills, the bishop and the congregation consecrated their partly finished church on March 9, 1902, 35 years after the groundbreaking. One month later, the church was transferred from the jurisdiction of the Church of England to the Episcopal Church of America. This reflected the political changes occurring in Hawaii after the monarchy was terminated in 1893. Bishop Willis, a staunch royalist, quietly stepped down, and the first American Episcopal bishop, the Right Reverend Henry Bond Resterick, was installed in August of 1902. In 1912, the congregation approved a new plan to add a memorial tower in honor of church worker Alice McIntosh. The tower was built next to the cathedral and housed a 600-pound bell. Originally hung in the pro-cathedral since 1875, this one bell was all the church could afford. In its day, the tower was one of the highest structures in town. From its roof, a visitor had unobstructed views of the waterfront and diamond head. Today, after additional periods of construction, St. Andrew's is now an exquisite house of worship. Known for its excellent music program, it is a fitting place for eight change ringing bells. The very next day, workmen in a donated forklift bring the bells into the tower. Bob Smith arrived the evening before and is ready for the installation. Honolulu corporations have responded to the arrival of the bells by donating equipment and labor for the installation. The ocean passage for the bells from England to Honolulu has been underwritten by the shipping company. Clearly, the community has welcomed these bells. Up the trap door through the top of the tower comes the progression of bells, from the heaviest to the lightest. They will rest on top of the frame, waiting for the bolts that will tie them to their fittings. What we can do is we can pull this way and let that one out as we swing across. Don't know whether it's worth taking that cross bracing out. Before we put the clappers in, I'll stand on the frame and with the wheel swing it right round. When it's gone round once, the bearings are any good, they'll go round a second time as well, just under its own swing. Yeah, we 
<laughs> On the second day, Bob is joined up in the tower by his wife, Ruth. They met each other ringing bells and have together installed bells in England as well as in Australia and Texas. She assists him with the fitting and the testing. There needs to be a mechanism to prevent the bell ringer going round and round and being taken up to the ceiling. Uh, and uh, it means, therefore, that we have to fit what's called um, uh, slider gear. The delicate adjustment of sliders, stays and stops will take the Smiths a week to finish. Into the now crowded tower come the flywheels, which were also constructed in England. That's wheels it's on the outside, so it's, it's this side. Number? Uh, we're going to do number two next. Oh, the space here is fine. It's just right for these bells. It could just have been made for it. Um, if they'd been a couple of hundred weight heavier, we'd have been struggling to have got them in. If they'd been any lighter, they really would have been a bit too pingy for a, a lovely tower like this. So. They could almost have been cast for this tower. They're absolutely ideal. Look at that while I just swing it and see. Swings true. Keep up. For the first time since 1911, the bells are heard, perhaps only by Bob, Ruth, and a handful of pigeons, but it is a momentous occasion. suggesting that this side does have some sound control on immediately because this has got the two biggest bells and the, you can hear that the sound coming out from here is the greatest. Ruth Smith seems at home in a bell tower. After hanging bells all day, she's formed an opinion about a particular one. It so happens that the treble bell, which is the lightest bell, is the only one that has the name of a queen on it. And this is Queen Lilio Ukulani. And, um, of course, I rather like the idea that uh, one of the bells is going to be named after a queen uh, amongst all the kings. Today is Easter Sunday, and the Cathedral Church of St. Andrews is filled to maximum capacity. Today also is the dedicatory ring for the bells. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The word of the Lord. As these are the first set of change ringing bells in Honolulu, there are no local experienced ringers. So as with other things in Hawaii, ringers must be imported from elsewhere. I'd like to welcome the ladies and gentlemen, and Jeff White, his wife over here, and Bob and Ruth Smith, and uh, Robert Finley, and Sir Henry and the others. Uh, would the bell ringers just stand, please, and let us greet you? 22 bell ringers have come from Australia, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Canada, the mainland United States, and as far away as London to be here today. It is a special treat to ring a dedicatory peal, which will last about 45 minutes. The others will ring the bells throughout the day.
I wasn't expecting it. And I walked out. The bells were everywhere. And <laughs> I love it. It makes it sound like a cathedral should. It's a glorious day, obviously. This is what we've all worked for, and, and uh, it sounds as terrific as, as we thought it would sound. And I am pleased as I could be with, with the entire day and everything that's happened, and, and it makes all the hard work worth it. I'm told by Lath Reynolds that this is the fastest that this has been accomplished ever. I mean, he says that it normally takes two to three years, and we've done it um, from the time that we were told that bells were available. We've done it in about a year, perhaps a little, a little more. So, any comments after having done the first field? Well, they're still pretty loud. Let's, 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 All right. Oh, I was going to go to the visitors book out so that people can, uh, who rang this morning can sign it. It's a bit sticky up there. Very, very sticky. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, we've got to the end. They are the ring of bells that we think is worthy of the tower in which they hang at the moment. Um, uh, Ruth and myself have got a lot of personal satisfaction uh, from hanging the bells. Uh, and I've got an additional satisfaction from having designed the bell frame and seen it installed. And uh, so we're highly delighted. It couldn't have been a better day. My thoughts as we started the court appeal that it was probably the only occasion in my life that I will ever be able to say I have rung the very first court appeal on a new ring of bells for the first time and it, it was a tremendous sense of occasion. It's a very interesting ring of bells because it's the first one down in this part of the world of course and what it means to us in fact is that ringers who are doing trips out possibly to Australia and New Zealand will now have Honolulu well and truly on the map because this is the place where the bells, which are rung the way that we ring them, and they'll want to come here and meet the local ringers. And ringers are, are a big family, we're a worldwide family, and we, we like to keep contact with each other and to see what's going on in other parts of the world. Ringing is a very peculiar sort of art, and really, if all it was was just standing up the tower, not saying anything to anybody, just pulling on ropes, and then just going home, it wouldn't really be much fun. It's the social side of it, really, that uh, is one of the very big attractions of ringing. And this is taking the social side just a little bit far. Normally, after ringing, we go down and have a drink for an hour or so. This time, we've all travelled 12,000 miles or so to come here. Yes, you can make this wonderful noise. Uh, it involves a lot of practice, a lot of skill. There's the um, self-discipline to be able to do it properly. Uh, the concentration that's required to do it pro properly. They're all challenges and it's not easy to produce really first-class ringing. During their visit, the ringers from England and New Zealand spent time with the St. Andrew students, patiently teaching how to handle the ropes. Assisted, a student will begin with either the downstroke or the handstroke. Only after he has control of both movements will he be allowed to ring his bell alone. One is ever mindful that a massive bell weighing hundreds of pounds swings above. The bell feels light in comparison to its actual mass. The goal is to have the right touch on the tufted part called the sally. Each bell ringing organization has its own colors. St. Andrews has chosen the Hawaiian Royal Red and Gold. The installation of the bells is finished and the guests have gone home. However, on a quiet Saturday afternoon, these people come to learn a British folk art and to bring to voice the ancient bells now named for Hawaiian kings and queens. Jeff White is an expert bell ringer from Vancouver. A retired pilot, he has volunteered to teach the new St. Andrews ringers for the next three months. He is assisted by Robert Finlay, a New Zealander who works as an engineer in Honolulu. They will be joined by Mrs. Fiona Norris, a South African woman who also lives and works in Honolulu. We have found generally that there is always at least one 
person in every English speaking city around the world who has had some experience in change ringing. Gently. That's it, top. Gently. Yes. Both hands together. The fledgling ringers have benefited from their brief sessions with the guest ringers. As St. Andrews has the only set of bells in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the presence of the visitors has given them the opportunity to see how proper ringing is done. Each of you just try and follow the other hands in front. Follow the other hands about two feet behind them. Just keep on, keep your eyes on the other rope, the other hands. First of all, um, a bell ringer has to have an ability to concentrate um, and keep his or her mind on what they're doing. Um, they also have to be able to um, re react to other people because bell ringing is always a team effort. And um, if one person um, gets out of phase, uh, he or, sh or she has to be put to right very quickly. The younger you get them, the more enthusiastic they are, and when enthusiasm's there, it's, it's, it's a joy to someone you teach. My first time that I did it by myself was really a big time because I was worried about grabbing the rope, because if you miss the rope and it breaks on you, then there's all this trouble and there's a lot of adrenaline going through. But actually ringing it's a lot of fun because you have to um, compete with everybody else. I find myself constantly competing with all the adults to make sure they don't mess up because when I'm the, you're the youngest, you don't want to mess up because then they all pound on you, right? But then ringing with them in front of the entire church is a lot of fun because everybody else is out there and they're listening. It's been a lot of fun. I mean, I, I remember, I, I didn't get involved when the bells came, but they announced in church, you know, if people wanted to learn to ring bells. And I, I thought it might be interesting, but I thought it might be more interesting for my son Christopher, so I did it just to get him to do it and now we're both hooked. <laughs> it's been lots of fun. Watch next. Four, four, five, two, three. Four, five, two, three. When one four, first two, encounters three. the written form of change ringing, one realizes it is nothing five, like classical Western music two, notation. Three, four, five, two, Notes are replaced by numbers, four, four, each three. representing a bell. Endless five, lines of numbers three, substitute for stanzas. Four, five, four, there is no instruction two, as to tempo or rhythm. The composition is called a method. This is what is called change ringing. An ancient art, the names reflect the country of its origin, such as Kent Treble Bob, Plain Hunt, and Oxford. Each bell has a number. Today, these methods can be created by computers. Five, two, three, four, five. Now, you see we're beginning to form a pattern here, whereby two goes in this direction. Two goes in the back, then starts coming down to lead here. And each of these bells forms the same pattern. They're either coming down to lead or going out towards the back. In an earlier teaching session, the Britishers acted out the patterns of change ringing by using handbells and their bodies. Okay, all ready? Treble's going, treble's gone. Two, follow three. Two, follow four. One of the most appealing aspects of bell ringing is the social life. Traditionally, after a session, the group of ringers, known as a band, adjourns to the nearest pub for an ale and many stories. The Honolulu group is no exception. Today's party, however, has a sad theme. It is a goodbye party for Jeff White, who returns to Vancouver tomorrow. Robert Finley and Fiona Norris will continue the instruction. The comradeship of these ringers is a gift of the bells. One senses that, regardless of their solitary ring of bells in the Pacific, these ringers have discovered the heart of bell ringing, the community of those people who love the sounds of history.
placed on the waist. On the bottom lips of the bells are a number of inscriptions or homilies that were cast into the bells when they were last recast in 1812. One of them is a short phrase which runs basically that the bells have a number of duties. One is to mourn the passing. Another is to praise God with hymns. And a third is to do public good. I ask that these bells be accepted and put to these uses. This program has been funded in part by a grant from Olelo, the Corporation for Community Television, Honolulu.